starting with number five, we have Behemoth. No, 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 not the ride of Canada's Wonderland. I'm talking about the mythological beast that dates back to the beginning of mankind, and whose name is now an adjective for any large or powerful being. The name Behemoth originated historically from the archaic Jewish name Prohippopotamus, and is described as a beast from the biblical book of Job. He is a form of the primeval chaos monster created by God at the beginning of creation, being paired up with the other chaos monster, Leviathan. And according to later Jewish tradition, both would become food for the righteous at the end time. Hey, uh, if I wind up qualifying as righteous, can I have a funnel cake instead? Once again, not any kind of reference to the theme park. These beings came first, but now I'm kind of in the mood to tackle a roller coaster. While I've established that Behemoth was a brutish beast known for incredible strength, legend says he was originally created to help stabilize the world, and is known to create chaos in humans' lives, just like my roommate. He is said to take the form of a colossally large elephant with pitch black eyes covered in white scales that appear to be falling off, and has teeth the size of Mount Everest. Uh, yeah, that's a little too big for my liking. The direct quote from the Book of Job that I mentioned earlier is as follows. Fifteen behold behemoth, which I made as I made you, he eats grass like an ox. Sixteen behold his strength in his loins, and his power in the muscles of his belly. Seventeen he makes his tail stiff like a cedar, the sinews of his thighs are it together. 18. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like bars of iron. 19. He is the first of the works of God. Let him who made him bring near his sword. 20. For the mountains yield food for him where all the wild beasts plague. 21. Under the lotus plants he lies, in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh. 22. For his shade. The lotus trees cover him, the willows of the brook surround him. 23. Behold, if the river is turbulent, he is not frightened. He is confident through Jordan rushes against his mouth. 24. Can one take him by his eyes? or pierce his nose with a snare. Behemoth and Leviathan make an appearance in Revelation 13, as they try to fight against God and can be only slain by God. Thessalonians 2.8, Revelation 19.19.20, both these beasts are extremely strong, unruly, and untamable in nature. In Revelation 13.11.12, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns, like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. 12. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. And that's enough Bible babble for right now. In fourth place, we have Vine, an earl and king of hell. This earl commands a simple 36 legions of demons. Because I know y'all are gonna make me do the math for this one, a legion is anywhere from 3,000 to 6,000 demons. So roughly between 108 to 216,000 demons. Where's my gold star for calculating that, and how are there so many demons? The significance of his name seems to be from the Latin word venea, vine, which is also the name given to an ancient war machine made of wood and covered with leather and branches, used to overthrow walls. In terms of his appearance, once summoned, he will show up resembling a lion and holding a viper in his hands. Now, I don't do well with snakes. So if you request him to change said appearance, he will present in human form, with long black hair, black wings, and now holding a golden cane. I know there's people out there who might be attracted to this, present company included, but don't take that as encouragement to summon him. Known as one of the most difficult demons to summon and work with, he is also one of the only demons who can identify witches and warlocks without being previously informed about their abilities, along with having the ability to tell the past and future, which I can see is kind of tempting. Vine is insensitive to humanity and cares little for harming those who summon him, making him wildly unpredictable and dangerous to summon, along with having the power to take souls without requiring permission. I repeat, dangerous. Right in the- Number three, unicorns. Hold up. This is scarier than the devil, right? Unicorns? Really? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not the glittery ones with Farrah Fawcett hair like Hercules rides. More like a firstborn bull. Giant, with a huge spear on its head. He has majesty, and his horns are the horns of a wild ox. And with them, he shall gore the peoples, all of them, to the ends of the earth. Okay, yeah, that's really aggressive. I guess unicorns were a little bit scarier in the Bible, huh? Couple times these things are brought up too. It seems like a lot of people were seeing these. Yeah, I'd say a hunk in a suit on a television series is much less scary than a monster horse goring you to death. A ram is mentioned nine times in the Hebrew Bible. It's been translated to unicorn in the King James Version, and some translations as oryx, which was seen as a wild ox or rhinoceros. Quote, And the unicorn shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. Uh, yeah. Harsh. I mean, rhinos and other single-horned animals do do this. 
The Bible describes unicorns skipping like calves, traveling like bulls, and bleeding when they die. So they were real and very mortal, mostly believed to be an exaggeration though. Even Julius Caesar speaks of them. Quote, a little below the elephant in size and appearance, color and shape of a bull, their strength and speed are extraordinary. They spare neither man nor wild beast. Were the ancients seeing like giant extinct rhinos? Were these flying evil narwhals just goring everyone to the end of the earth? Who knows? Sure sounds like it. Number two, locusts. Dude, I'm already afraid of the 12 inch flying praying mantises that do exist today. I can't imagine what these things looked like. Imagine a dog sized flying insect blocking out the sun because there's so many of them. Abaddon's locusts. These things were terrifying. The Bible has this to say about them. The fifth angel, apparently Abaddon, sounded his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by smoke from the abyss and out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions. These demon bugs are well detailed in the Bible. They're described as, quote, horse-like creatures preparing for battle, adorned with crowns of gold above their head. Their face is like a man, but woman's hair with lion's teeth. Their body was locust-like, covered with iron breastplates. They have scorpion-like stings on their tails and razor-sharp claws, and the sound of their army will be like a million horses marching to the battlefield. Dude, that's a locust? Like a locust, the bug? No, 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 I don't think so. They will be freed by their master Abaddon from the bottomless pit and will torment all of the remaining sinners on earth for five months. Abaddon is described as the king of the army of locusts. Yeah, guy's really into bugs. Yeah, that's like some fear factor stuff right there. Just like a million bugs swarming you? No, no thanks. And coming in at number one, the dragon. Okay, there's some speculation here that this thing is the devil himself. The devil and the dragon. But also this thing apparently lives with the devil. I don't know, people were saying mixed things, but important thing is things weren't too literal back then and they were really spiritual. People were just trying to explain what they were seeing and feeling the best way they could. But yes, there was dragons. Yeah, we have the skeleton bones. Okay? And before you're picturing something fun like Dudley the dragon or the ones that talk in The Hobbit who sit atop gold, no, no, no. Picture when it sneezes, it flashes light. Its eyes are like the red of dawn. Lightning leaps from its mouth. Flames of fire flash out. Smoke streams from its nostrils like steam from a pot heated over burning rushes. Its breath would kindle coals for flames shoot from its mouth. Yeah, this thing, terrifying. Tremendous strength of Leviathan's neck strikes terror wherever it goes. Its flesh is hard and firm and cannot be penetrated. Job 41, 18, 23. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world was thrown down to the earth with all the angels. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from its mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. They are demonic spirits who work miracles and go out to the rulers of the world to gather them for battle against the Lord on that great judgment day of God the Almighty. He seized the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for thousands years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until a thousand years were finished. Okay, yeah, that sounds like one giant amazing cutscene from a God of War game. Just chucking a dragon into a pit? Also, it's 2022. We better lock that thing back up. It's been more than a thousand years now, no? Quote, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. Okay, so it wears seven crowns. Maybe this thing is the devil. It's mentioned numerous times in the Bible. I've seen Game of Thrones. This thing is scary. Yeah. Coming in at number five, we've got the Midianites. Okay, so before we get into any Christian, Judaic, or Gnostic demons, we should probably fire some movie demons into the spotlight. We've come so close to talking about this movie so many times, so why not today? Nightbreed is a cult classic that never really hit the big times. Released back in 1990, director Clive Barker didn't get final cut and was disappointed with how it ended up. Years later, a majority of the unused footage was discovered and Scream Factory managed to release a director's cut. Based on Barker's short story Cabal, this is quite the empathetic take on monsters living in a 
graveyard. At the beginning of the flick, the audience is introduced to some rapid fire demon craziness, resulting in the impression that these grotesque monsters are evil troublemakers. It soon becomes apparent that they are far from evil, and the so called good guy psychotherapist is the real madman. The Midianites, even if they have horrid features, are a largely peaceful race of monsters. They live on their own beneath the cemetery. Midian has its own unique culture, customs, and laws, and they have no intention on starting any trouble with humans. In fact, humans are the ones who decide they've got a problem with them before launching a full-scale assault complete with an Albertan militia. Through some wicked mental gymnastics by Dr. Decker, played by David Cronenberg, folks are convinced that the Midianites are the last bastion of evil and must be destroyed. However, once the battle begins, it becomes very clear that all they want to do is live unimpeded. In fact, the entire movie proves how good these beings truly are. They accept Boone into their ranks and even give him a second chance after he breaks their laws. They take good care of their children and do their best to offer all their citizens comfort and supplies in order to live. It just goes to show that humans tend to demonize the other in an attempt to simplify our world when we should be embracing those differences. Maybe just letting the other live in peace is the answer after all. Don't tell the colonies. Coming in at number four, we've got Amon. All right, now that I've done my requisite movie talk, let's head into some more mythical demons. We'll start with Amon, Marquis of Hell that governs 40 infernal legions. He's quite the ugly sucker, which might contribute to his bad reputation. According to Johann Weir, who wrote of Amon in the Pseudo Monarchia Daemonum, Amon or Amon is a great and mighty Marquis and cometh abroad in the likeness of a wolf having a serpent's tail, vomiting flames of fire. When he putteth on the shape of a man, he showeth out dog's teeth and a great head like a mighty nighthawk. He is the strongest prince of all other and understandeth of all things past and to come. He procureth favor and reconcileth both friends and foes and rule 40 legions of demons. So he's got a wolf body, a serpent's tail, and a raven's head. Nice. Most folks would be afraid of a creature like this, which makes sense. Chimeras of all types tend to freak folks out. However, Amon is a nice guy. He's known for reconciling friends and foes, making the world a better place for all involved. If he were truly evil, he would encourage more discord between people instead of helping them get past it. Amon also procures love for those seeking it, and if that doesn't warm your cold heart, I don't know what would. So if you're feeling lonely, let Amon play Cupid for you. Who knows? Maybe the demon will come back with info on a hunky honker, babely babe. Just pray it's not a succubus. Number three, the Leviathan. Okay, at first I was like, oh, that's a roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. No, 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 this vicious monster was actually modeled after this vicious monster. The Leviathan, the second of the great monsters described in the book of Job. This Leviathan, Leviathan, is an absolute massive sea monster who's impervious to human weapons, breathes fire, and emits smoke from his nostrils. Uh, yeah, so this is a Zelda boss, for sure. The Leviathan is probably related to another ancient monster called Lotan, a seven-headed giant serpent who represents primeval chaos, as with pretty much every other biblical creature does. Hey, these things aren't meant to be cute and fuzzy. There's some less exciting theories that insist the Leviathan is just a dramatic interpretation of a crocodile or anaconda or maybe a plesiosaur resembling something like the Loch Ness Monster. But that doesn't explain the breathing fire thing or the size. Was this giant sea snake a water dragon? Because apparently it's like 300 miles long. Yeah, terrifying. Scary thing now is many different religions and cultures have their own version of the Leviathan. Tiamat, Hydra, Jormungandr. Maybe this thing was just hunted into extinction. I don't know. What do you think? Number two, Archangel Michael. It is said that the angels are not humans, but creatures made from God's creation. I've also seen what the Bible describes angels looking like, and it's not handsome people with wings. Apparently, a lot of these things, people really couldn't even describe what they were seeing in front of them. But we'll get to what these things look like in a minute. Of those creatures, Satan, AKA Lucifer, is one, the one. However, here is even one creature that Satan fears more than any creature, and that's fellow Archangel Michael or Saint Michael. Some say they're brothers, some say they were on the same team for a bit. This is some good stuff, people. Quote, now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Revelation 12, 7, 9. Okay, so hold on. He and them are all down here with us? That's terrifying. 
Apparently Michael led that army that won, so whatever scares Satan scares the hell out of me as well. Also, all these pictures and statues of him and like window panes are all of him like wielding a giant sword made of light, just stepping on Satan's back as a hero. That's pretty intimidating, not gonna lie. And coming in at the number one spot, Ophanim. Okay, so what angels actually looked like? Apparently it was like giant geometrical feathers with eyes and a consciousness. Some had horns, some had hooves, lots of gold and metal colors. This next thing doesn't even make sense to my brain. I feel like this is an anthill trying to understand an iPhone. Quote, as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparked like topaz and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel, intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures were faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. Ezekiel 1, 15, 18. Uh, first off, is this thing even a creature? Yeah, everything I see here is an alien. Is this just us trying to process some sort of like energy being with eyes? Because if I saw Lucifer that looks like the hunk on the Netflix show, and then I saw this thing? One of the Dead Sea Scrolls interprets them as angels. Late sections of the Book of Enoch interprets them as class of celestial beings who don't sleep and guard the throne of God. Whatever these thing or things are, it sounds and looks absolutely horrifying. How could you paint that on a ceiling? I would just give up and paint wings in a halo as well. For real though, like that is a spaceship of some sort, isn't it? I mean, I understand the times, maybe the science wasn't there, but this thing is straight out of a sci-fi novel. In at five, a quill. Now there is very little known about a quill, but what we know is is that he is the demon who presides over Sundays and exists within Christian mythology. His purpose is to destroy and degrade the practice of keeping the Sabbath holy, which might not sound absolutely terrible, but if this dude possesses the wrong person, it could be bad news bears for all of us. Imagine the president, a prime minister, even one senator possessed and suddenly we have to work seven days a week without a single day off. Yeah. Okay, it's a stretch, but there's a reason he is at our number five. Honestly, no one wants to work long weekends. Just saying. Also, Apologies in advance if I pronounce all these names wrong. I'm not a demon. Shh. In at four, Sergat. Now, Sergat is a minor demon referenced in the grimoire of Pope Honorius, but this does not diminish the fact that he is straight up evil. He's listed as, I quote, Sergat who opens all locks, and his opposite is actually our previous number, a quill. So before we even get into this demon, we should discuss how many demons are actually mentioned in the great grimoire of Honorius. Who was he? Historians aren't even sure, but they do think that he was Honorius III, who was the Pope from 1216 to 1227. Now, no one is quite sure if he wrote the book or not, but he is famous among popes for deliberately conducting ceremonies to summon demons so he could banish the demons back down to hell. A little odd. This dude does not mess around. Now how does Sergat come into play? Well as previously mentioned, he makes appearances in the Grimoire of Honorius, and he is incredibly deceptive and cunning, making him one of the most terrifying demons throughout history. And in the Bible. Yeah, he's there too. Now as quoted before, this dude is known as the one who opens all locks, which essentially means he is capable of understanding and opening any and all locks in the entire world, making it almost impossible to escape him or conceal yourself from him. When someone becomes Sergat's target, he relentlessly pursues them no matter how hard they try to escape. And once he reaches his victims, he frightens them by presenting them with images that result in them going mad. Yikes. Don't summon this bad boy. Coming at number three, we've got Lilith. Speaking of succubi who tend to get a bad rap, let's talk about Lilith. Legends say that Lilith was Adam's first wife. She lived with him in Eden for a while, but was expelled for refusing to submit to him. After this, she became a legendary demonic figure, famous for stealing babies and seducing young men. Not the best reputation I know, but there've been worse. Leave it to history to demonize women who didn't listen to their husbands. Still, after centuries of bad press, it seems like Lilith has turned a corner. Modern scholars seem to have found a different way to interpret this famous sensual seductress. After being created equal to Adam, she didn't enjoy being treated as a lesser being, so she left. In doing so, she opened herself up to a whole lot of slander from all who felt that she needed to be put down. This created all the legends involving her body tendencies and succubal urges. So while she's often portrayed as a baby snatching demon with a huge personality, it's more likely that she's just someone who decided to force her independence before that was socially acceptable. No wonder so many witches and feminists look up to her. Coming in at number two, we've got Gop. All right, I'm gonna catch some flack from some of our more old-fashioned viewers on this one, but hear me out. Gop is a demon prince in human form who incites love. 
Classic. Love is good in the world. But in some readings, he provides further services which may or may not be interpreted as good by some in our modern society. He provides medical care for women, which is fantastic, but he's also known for transforming women to make it easier to get a lover and also renders them infertile. So they can find lovers more easily and will not have any accidental babies. Of course, if you plan on having kids, this is a bad thing. But kids, in this economy? So depending on your position on these topics, Gop would be really awesome or... Not that. But add in his powers of philosophy and liberal arts, and you've got a pretty wicked college professor. Gop is known for teaching these topics, making people invisible, stealing familiars from magicians, making men stupid, and carrying people quickly over long distances. I'd say these are all top-notch powers, especially the making men stupid part. I feel like I'd be a whole lot happier if I just didn't think so goddamn much, but maybe that's just me. To conclude, Gop, even though he looks like a pretty classic horned winged demon, isn't actually all that terrifying. And finally, at number one, we've got Bile. If you ever saw Bile, you'd freak out. He is a spider-esque creature with the heads of a cat, frog, and man all on full display. Or at least that's how he appears in the Dictionary Infernal. Either way, he is described as a combination of the three creatures. This kind of appearance would cause anyone to freeze up, but don't worry too much. He's also able to make folks invisible, which has plenty of utility. Of course, being invisible isn't too useful for doing good deeds, but I suppose that choice falls upon whoever invoked this odd demon. A more utilitarian power comes in the form of making people wise, and let's be honest, this is a much needed skill these days. Both of these powers are stronger in October, too, so you know he's a Halloween fiend. I'm not sure if that makes him less scary or more scary, but anyone who loves October is a friend of mine. Number five, Nephilim. This one I can get behind for sure. How the pyramids were built still baffles me, and reading all about these things at least makes my brain relax for a second. The giants, the talls, the long neck people, the Nephilim. Again, never been a Bible guy myself, so no judgment if you say all this happened, but I'm just catching up on all this stuff. But in short, the Nephilim were like the offspring of angels and human women, according to Genesis 6, 1, 4, and Jude. The Nephilim are also mentioned in Numbers 13, 33, but it is likely that by this time in Israel's history, Nephilim was used as a term for a tall, intimidating peoples. It's plausible that the Nephilim were both half angels and half giants, making them absolutely huge and absolutely Absolutely super strong. The Nephilim were the children of the sons of gods and daughters of men. And Christian scholars have theorized that the sons of gods were actually these demonic fallen angels who reproduced with women. Being the offspring of partial angelic heredity, the Nephilim were considered mighty men who are of old the men of renown. The ancients. These people were huge, claiming that they were like five times the size of an average man. In the Hebrew Bible, a group of mysterious beings or people of unusually large size and length who lived both before and after the flood were called Nephilimus, sometimes translated to giants. Even the fallen ones from the Hebrew Nephil, meaning to fall. Seems like these people were writing about similar stuff, huh? Spooky. Number four, 200 million horsemen. This next one is not really a creature as much as it's the end of a lot of all of us. All this Armageddon stuff they were saying, that's some pretty strange stuff that's on its way. Book of Revelation stuff, you know? Quote, I saw as God wanted to show me the horses and the men on them. The men had pieces of iron on their chests. These were red like fire and blue like the sky and yellow like sulfur. The heads of the horses looked like the heads of lions. Fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. One third part of all man was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur that came out of their mouths. Word for word, horsemen or ancient biblical technology? This sounds horrifying. Also, 200 million? That's a lot of flying flaming horses just trucking around the skies and sands like giant tanks firing fire fire out of their mouths and nose. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were gleaming metal. And from the midst of all this came likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had a human likeness. Hmm. Okay. You put a Baja hoodie on me at a Dave Matthews concert and hear me saying all that stuff, you probably just think I'm some sci-fi stoner. Nope. This is riveting material, folks. I need to read this thing front to back. Apparently, this force was supposed to have taken out or is going to take out a third of the entire world's population. I know like three things that can do that. Pandemics, missiles, and floods. 
However, if men and horses showed up with lion heads breathing fire, it's safe to say it's game over. Middle of the pack. In third place, we have Pazuzu. If your first response was to say bless you, we have the same sense of humor. You may be familiar with references made to him in The Exorcist and the House of Ashes video game, but we're not talking about Linda Blair's acting today. As an apotropaic entity, he was considered both a destructive and dangerous wind, but also a repellent to other demons, one who might safeguard the home from their influence if he was in the right mood. Remember, if he was in the right mood, kind of like me sometimes. He is quoted as introducing himself by stating, I am Pazuzu, son of Anubu, king of the evil Lilu demons. I was enraged in violent motion against the strong mountains and ascended them. Lilu demons are the class to which Pazuzu and his leagues of demons belong. There is also a notable connection to the earlier Babylonian personifications of the four winds. These beings, as depicted on several cylinder seals, have wings and each represents a different direction of the north, south, east, and west winds. It's important to note that Noted professor of ancient studies, Franz Wigerman calls attention to the crooked positioning of the masculine west wind in seals. Franz Wigerman calls attention to the crooked positioning of the masculine west wind in seals, which is similar to the posture in Pazuzu's physical depiction. More connections appear in later seals, as this same bent over figure takes on talons and a scorpion's tail. The main difference in their depictions is the head, and the conclusion was made that it is Pazuzu's body and not his head that denotes him as a wind demon. Another scholar, Scott Neweagle, asserts that Pazuzu's possession of four wings links to the term kipatu, meaning circle, loop, circumference, and totality, suggesting his control over all cardinal directions of wind was inherited from his predecessors. Pazuzu was often depicted with a man's body, the head of a lion or a dog, talons for feet, two pairs of wings, a scorpion's tail, and a serpentine phallus. Around now, you might be thinking, Pazuzu is a long name. He has to have some sort of a, you know, nickname or other moniker, right? Sure. He's been called the agony of mankind, suffering of mankind, or disease mankind. Take your pick. This god of wind and plague is known as Lucifer's right hand man and has the power to control and rule over other evil spirits, being known to bring forth droughts and famine. It is said that he conspired with Lucifer to overthrow God and they were thrown out of heaven together. He is fond of corrupting the innocent and good, being known to offer help that appears good and benevolent, but actually requires recipients to request more of his assistance, sending them further and further into his debt sentencing them to an afterlife of eternal agony. See, reality is agony enough, so I'll pass. Our runner-up for today is Sergat, first mentioned in history in 1517, whose deceptive and cunning mind make him one of the most tricky demons you could possibly think of summoning. Due to his name, he is associated closely with Saturdays. Sure, he might be the least known demon on this list, lacking the background detail that emphasizes the other demons, but he is still very much to be feared. He is known as the one who can open all locks, which may seem a little silly on the surface level, but once summoned, he is impossible to escape or to conceal yourself from unless it's on his terms. Targets of Sergat are relentlessly pursued until found, and then presented with imagery until they go mad. He was the last demon to be summoned by known demon hunter and documentarist Pope Honorarius in his grimoire. Honorarius had thoroughly documented the strengths and weaknesses of every demon he summoned during his research into the oncoming War Against Demons, but had only written ability to open locks about Zergat before his untimely death, leaving history to believe Zergat was responsible for this event. Now, I'm not gonna spell out how to summon him because I hope I've made it clear enough by now that I exist to discourage that kind of behavior, but I did find it kind of neat that one would need a nail from an old coffin to do so. Oh, and before I forget, Zergat is invisible when he manifests, making him easy to lose track of. And in first place, we have Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies, Lord of Dung, and God of Filth himself. He is described visually as a smaller, and hunched over creature with red or purple skin, ram horns, a forked tongue, and a long tail along with incredibly powerful wings. Kinda sounds like a D&D character. He often prefers to appear as a fly when summoned, which may sound innocent until you consult history. Flies were believed to have been born from rotting flesh and uh, plagues. According to Christian beliefs, he began his career as a false god, convincing men to worship him and trick them so he could give faulty advice that would harm instead of helping those in need. Before in the comments asks for a Bible citation, since I haven't been including them for all of the listings today, I'll mention it now. In Mark 3.22, the scribes accused Jesus Christ of driving out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. The name also appears in the expanded version in Matthew 12.24, 
27, and Luke 11:15, 18, 19, as well as in Matthew 10:25. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, "Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out?" So then, they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Funny, hanging around this spooky stuff has me quoting the Bible more than I ever thought I would in my lifetime. Guess I should have paid more attention to my middle school religion classes, or when I was altar serving as a kid, instead of just figuring out the perfect angle to tip a candle at to splash wax on my arm. What? Never said I was a normal kid. Beelzebub is commonly described as placed high in hell's hierarchy. According to the stories of the 16th century occultist Johann Weyer, Beelzebub led a successful revolt against the devil, is the chief lieutenant officer of Lucifer, the emperor of hell, and presides over the order of the fly. And I thought I was a workaholic. The 17th century exorcist Sebastien Michaelis, in his admirable history, placed Beelzebub among the three most prominent fallen angels, the other two being Lucifer and Leviathan. John Milton, in his epic poem, Paradise Lost, published in 1667, identified the unholy trinity of Beelzebub, Lucifer, and Aseroth, with Beelzebub as the second ranking of the many fallen angels, a quote from him claiming, Satan except, none high or sad. In simple English, only second place is Satan here. His specialty is in tormenting mankind, causing wars, instigating murders, and known for his ability to place humans under the spell of other demons upon request. One thing historians have been able to settle on is which major sin he represents, with some claiming pride, others gluttony, but also some claim idolatry. Personally, since he allegedly originated from being a false god, I'm going to side with idolatry. But let me know in the comments which one you believe. Coming in at number five, we've got Astaroth. You feeling lazy lately? After a good year or so indoors, followed by some intense socialization, you probably feel like it's time to hibernate again. Fall is rapidly approaching, and with it, the desire to drink hot tea and never leave the house. There are horror movies to be watched and fall recipes to be cooked. But be careful! If you use all of this as an excuse, you might be under the influence of Astaroth. Riding around on the back of a dragon and carrying a staff that sort of looks like a snake, this dude is all about laziness. Astaroth's whole deal is tempting mortals into being lazy. Once he gets them there, it's so much easier to manipulate them into bad behavior. More souls for hell, more blood for the blood god, and all that good stuff. Sounds like fun, right? That's not all he does though, although that is a pretty rough task. People are naturally inclined to laziness anyway, so being tempted into that kind of thing is the worst. In addition to that though, he's also the treasurer of hell, and helps the new demons get a hang of things when they first show up, showing them the super hot ropes and whatnot. Interesting that Hell has a currency that they needed organized, eh? I'm sure he does plenty of laundering across all sorts of seedy underworld activities. Interestingly enough, witches see Astaroth a little differently. They consider him a female demon with expertise in all sorts of areas, more specifically, lust, protection, and love. So Astaroth can be many things, but one thing is for sure, and that is Astaroth's terrible breath. That's a fun little demonic detail. In Christian lore, it appears that Astaroth also has dominion over math, and can make people invisible in their search for treasure, so uh, Nathan Drake and Indiana Jones may have something to talk to this demon about. And like most demons of higher orders, Astaroth can answer any questions asked as long as they fall under the topics he knows about. Coming in at number 4, we've got Olivier. A real jerk, this one. We can see this playing out across all cultures and eras, and it's always justified by some ridiculous standard. Cruelty and hatred towards the poor and disenfranchised. More than ever, the line between stable and in the street is thin and blurry, and Olivier takes full advantage of this. I'm sure all sorts of entrepreneurs, influencers, and money hoarders have been visited by this demon. Olivier, baby! The so-called prince of archangels down in the depths, and patron demon of encouraging malice and viciousness towards the poor. That is indeed a low, low demon to be. We live in a messed up world already, why should the poor be reviled for simply being poor? At what point do we decide that work is the ultimate good and that nothing else can stand in for that morally or economically? It seems as though the folks who do the most important, most real work, say building the structures that we inhabit or bringing food to the masses, get the short end of the stick. 
and Olivier apparently has a fair share in keeping that the way things are. Middle managers and corporate drones keep their specific machines chugging and then dump on the poor, telling them that they should simply work harder. Forget Astaroth making folks lazy, making folks think that others are lazy for not making as much money as them is really wild. Olivier, you really are a rat, aren't you? In at three, Agaris. Agaris is a demon described in demonological grimoires as a duke. Under the power of the east, an old man riding upon a crocodile and carrying a hawk on his fist. Agaris is known to teach languages, however he also stops and retrieves runaways, causing his earthquakes and grants noble titles. Now I shouldn't technically be saying he, because Agaris can be a man or a woman. If the demon is a man, the man is old and riding said crocodile. If the demon is a woman, she is young and angelically beautiful. Now it's surprising how many demons are teachers. They instruct those they visit or possess, and grant knowledge and power, so I guess it's not all bad. The exorcists seem to miss out that little nugget of information. Now although this demon is downright evil, he or she will grant you the knowledge of every language in the world. World. However, the bad news, he or she will only teach you the foulest and most offensive words, so say bye bye to your friends, I guess. Yeah, you'll be educated, but you will be vile beyond belief. So, you'll be me. In at 2, Renov. In demonology, Renov is described as a Marquis and the Great Earl of Hell, hence why he is number 2 on our list. This dude commands 20 legions of demons, making him one of the most notorious demons throughout history, one that you certainly don't want to be messing around with. Now, what makes him quite the enigma is that yes, he's awful, the worst, but he's also somewhat of a scholar. He teaches art, rhetoric languages, and gives loyal servants the favour of friends and foes. Now, you may be familiar with this demon, as he is the one who wrote How to Win friends and influence people. Which is horrible enough, but what makes this demon truly terrible is that he is the taker of old souls. Basically this means anyone who is older, older looking, or looks a little under the weather, Renov will claim them. Also pets are not immune to this, he will kill them too. Your best option is just to steer clear of all your elderly relatives, and consider getting a new, younger looking pet. Just saying, they gotta go. And finally coming in at number 1, Baphomet. This name may ring a bell for you, and that's because Baphomet is a deity that the Knights Templar were falsely accused of worshipping, following which time it was subsequently incorporated into occult and mystical traditions throughout history. It first appeared in trial transcripts for the Inquisition of the Knights Templar beginning in 1307, which resulted in it being popularised in the English language in the 19th century during debate and speculation on the reasons for the suppression of the Templars. The appearance of Baphomet is that of a goat, an image drawn by Eliphaz Levi, which contains binary elements representing the sum total of the universe. More interesting still, this picture of Baphomet is often used as a stand in for Satan, by Satanists and Christians alike. Now, it is a highly debated topic about whether this demon was truly good or bad, but if we look to historical accounts, Baphomet comes from a letter written by a French crusader in 1098. He describes the crusader's enemies in the Holy Land, I quote, calling upon Baphomet prior to battle. Baphomet refers to Muhammad, the prophet. European Christian dogma viewed the worship of Muhammad as idolatry, which was harnessed by a medieval European ruler in the form of a witch hunt targeting his political opponents. Coming in at number 5 we've got Asmodeus. A lot of folks take great issue with some of those classic vices, you know the ones, sex, Rock and roll, all plenty of fun, all the bane of Puritans and teetotalers across the globe. If you delve too deeply into any of the above, you could find yourself receiving plenty of disapproving looks. Too bad, considering how much folks tend to enjoy these things. Is it possible to have too much of a good thing? Hard to say, especially these days. Who knows when the good won't be available anymore. However, traditionally folks have looked down upon those consumed by lust, whether it be carnal, money focused, or otherwise. Thankfully you can blame a demon for all those urges. Isn't life funny that way? Who made up morality anyways? Why not just explain it all away by saying it's totally out of your control? Beautiful, it makes up for everything. So we've got Asmodeus, the supposed son of Adam, once an angel of harlotry. Of course, his angelic properties aren't really around anymore as he fell from heaven and now lives as a demon in the underworld. With time, he became more well known for stuff like gambling and lust, and somehow became Lilith's husband, which is fun. The two of them, both labeled temptresses, produced all sorts of demonic babies to keep the fires of hell hot. There's also the famous story of Asmodeus killing seven husbands in a row to keep one woman from consummating her marriage. Like, every time she got married, Asmodeus would show up and murk her husband before they could do the deed. But then she'd go out and get married again. At some point you think she'd 
learn and see a pattern and stop feeding her suitors to a demon, but hey, maybe she liked the demonic attention. Asmodeus is pretty wicked looking too. Rocking three hideous heads, this demon gets around by riding a dragon. This isn't his only look though, as he can appear as a few other forms to appeal to different types of people. I mentioned gambling before, and anyone with that kind of habit can thank Asmodeus for it. Gotta love it. Lastly, his powers do tend to get stronger in November, so once Halloween wraps up, be on the lookout. Lust might not stick around as easily once everyone puts away their sexy costumes, but hey. Coming at number 4 we've got Abyssithibu. Rocking with another fallen angel here, we've got Abyssithibu. A little tougher to say in spell, but just as scary and powerful. Raunchy as all hell too. See, Abyssithibu left heaven at the same time as the devil himself and didn't take the fall that well. He used to be a flatterer of God, but once he took that trip to the down below, things got ugly. If you're familiar with the most legendary gaming villain of all time, you'll see some inspiration here. While falling, Abyssithibu was used as a life raft of sorts by other fallen angels. They grabbed at his body and managed to take hold of one of his wings. This led to the feathered appendage being torn off, leaving our poor demon to be with only one wing. Eventually, it did sort of grow back, but not as it was. Mm -mm. Abyssithibu is known for having a red, grotesque wing. That's how many recognize this demon. Badass, but probably really upsetting to deal with after many lifetimes of perfect angelic wings. Like I said, once he made it to hell, things went extra south. He rules over Tartarus, which is essentially hell jail. All of the worst of the worst reside here, suffering eternal torment in a cage of their own creation. How lovely. Abyssithibu also has quite the command of sorcery, able to cast powerful spells and persuade influential figures to act in unholy ways. For these reasons and more, it was decided that this demon could no longer have sway over humanity. Abyssithibu was eventually trapped in a pillar of air, meant to be trapped for eternity. Tough break for sure. However, many do believe that Abyssithibu will return one day and bring with him thousands of years of fury after being trapped so long. His red wing will unfurl and he will return to his vengeful and cruel ways. Who's excited? In at 3, Belphegor. Belphegor, along with a few other numbers on our list, is a demon and one of the seven princes of hell. His powers are of seduction, seducing people with money and inventions, promising endless riches. His role as a demon is to turn humans against each other through means of wealth. He uses our gluttonous desires to drive man to evil, promising fortune in the end. Other reports label him as hell's ambassador to France. Our title, and his adversary is Saint Mary Magdalene, one of the patron saints of France. His origin is that of a fallen angel and a false god that Moses handed down the death penalty for worshipping. He was dispatched to earth by Satan to deceive mortals, often taking the form of a beautiful woman, typically naked. Although sometimes he can appear as a demon, sporting leathery flesh, horns, sharp teeth, and a gaping mouth, ready to destroy mankind. In at two, Beelzebub. Identified in the New Testament, Beelzebub is the prince of demons. He holds a high position in hell's hierarchy and supposedly led a successful revolt against the devil. He is the chief lieutenant of Lucifer, the emperor of hell, and is often placed among the three most prominent fallen angels, the others being Lucifer and Leviathan. He is capable of flying, which is the worst, and is known as the lord of the fires or the lord of the flies. Beelzebub is rumored to be responsible for many demonic possessions throughout history. One of the most famous is the possession of Annalise McKell, a teenager who was diagnosed with epilepsy before a number of exorcisms were later performed, eventually resulting in her death. Beelzebub was also believed to be sowing his influence in Salem, Massachusetts. His name was repeatedly mentioned during the Salem witch trials. And finally in at number one, Lucifer. In classical mythology, Lucifer, meaning the bringer of light, was the name of the planet Venus. Though in many cases, Lucifer was represented as a winged child pouring light from a jar, or even a man bearing a torch. Now in Christianity, as we know, Lucifer became so obsessed with his own beauty and intelligence that he began to desire the honour and power that belonged to God, corrupting him and forcing God to cast him down to the underworld. It is also noted that once he was cast down, he changed his name from Lucifer to Satan, meaning adversary. And following the second coming of Christ, he was bound to the pits of hell during the 1000 year millennial kingdom over which Christ ruled. All in all, Satan is widely known as the devil himself, an evil entity that seduces humans into sin. He possesses power over the fallen world and a host of various demons. In 
Judaism, Satan is regarded as an agent subservient to God. There is no answer to whether Lucifer and Satan are two separate entities or whether Lucifer's fall from heaven created Satan. But an examination of several passages reveals that he can be none other than Satan, the devil himself. In it five mammon. In the New Testament of the Bible, mammon is a fallen angel. His name is thought to mean money, material, wealth, or any entity that promises wealth. He's essentially the embodiment of the cardinal sin, greed. Sounds like a swell guy. He is associated with the greedy pursuit of gain. I quote, you cannot serve both God and mammon. He is often personified as a deity and is included amongst the seven princes of hell. According to some readings, he is the son of Lucifer himself, conceived before his father fell from heaven and born after he was sent to hell. Before his fall from grace, I quote, he was more interested in heaven's golden pavement than its celestial leader. From the underworld, he comes up with schemes to manipulate humans into adding to his fortune. He is supposedly so powerful that innocent humans can be corrupted by him, adding to his treasures and fortunes instead of virtues that they can carry up to heaven. In at four, Abaddon. Abaddon is known as the angel of the bottomless pit, one of the many fallen angels we have on our list. In the New Testament book of Revelation, they are described as the king of an army of locusts as well as Destroyer, the Angel of the Abyss. As the King of Locusts, he has an army resembling horses with crowned human faces, women's hair, lion's teeth, wings, iron breastplates, and a scorpion stinger. Nasty. Many believe Abaddon to be the Antichrist, but others identify him as the angel as Satan. According to Revelation 9:11, after the fifth angel sounds his trumpet, a star falls from heaven and opens the bottomless pit. As the storm of smoke arises, and from the smoke, a plague of locusts emerge to torment, but not kill, men who lack the seal of God on their foreheads for five months. His origin gets a little hazy, making him appear to be the servant of God, yet also a servant of Satan. I guess it's up to you what you believe. Coming in number three, we've got Adramalek. So we talked about Beelzebub last time and his tendency to bring about terrible things. There's plenty of responsibility that comes being Lord of the Flies, and he's got to have some help from time to time. Unfortunately, there aren't any temp agencies or internship programs in hell. Most folks are just destined to do their jobs and do them for all of time. This is where Adramalek comes in. This demon does his best to give Beelzebub a hand by assisting the Lord of the Flies as a great minister and chancellor, a lofty title for such an interesting demon. On top of being this assistant in Hell's hierarchy, Adramalek was also known for being a sun god who demanded human sacrifice. So even before being adopted by those beneath the surface, he was causing trouble. I wonder how many humans were dropped in his name. And I wonder how many of them ended up in Hell, possibly even under his command. Makes you think now, doesn't it? There might be a moon god brother out there demanding similar bloodshed, but I can't make any guarantees. Lastly, before I go, I'll bring up a point I mentioned in another video. Adramalek has quite the eye for fashion, and quite possibly a taste for Prada. You see, the devil relies upon this particular demon for all of his wardrobe needs. That's right, Adramalek is in charge of the clothes the devil wears. You'd think that down in hell it wouldn't matter all that much, but vanity is a sin, so that fits right in. Coming in number two, we've got Vareen. Oh, this is a nasty one. Patience is a virtue indeed, and it is so easy to lose it. Plus, once patience is off the table, everything just gets so much worse. Sure, some can sit back, relax, and wait, but there are so many forces acting against you at all times. Who wants to wait, right? Especially in this era of constant and instant gratification. Why sit quietly and be ready for whatever when you can do a nosedive into your phone and drown in all of the readily available content? Hell, I bet a lot of you folks watching right now should be doing something else, or at least preparing to do something. Vareen is the demon of impatience and loves to push humans towards acting impatiently. He does it without delay too, no waiting in line, no queuing up, no sitting about until something good happens. So all the folks in your life who seem to act impatiently are probably being influenced by this demon. The dude in the beat up Corolla who doesn't seem to know what a zipper merge is and decides to rush all the way to the end of the disappearing lane to just nose his way in. Vareen. The lady at the supermarket who absolutely can't believe all of these selfish people with full carts in front of her line unbelievable despite her equally full cart. Vareen. Those folks who pre-order every gosh darn pop culture artifact they think is cool and then whine until it finally arrives in the mail. Vareen. Impatience will end us all, especially if we give in to it. Most things will come with time, but if you try too hard to speed up the process, you're just asking for heightened blood pressure and a desire to lash out at all those around you. And that's no fun. Some actually describe Vareen as a female demon too, so if you subscribe to that belief, ignore what I said before while referring to this entity as male. 
Interestingly enough, this impatient demon is mostly aligned with creation rather than destruction, which is a strange thing for a demon to do, but hey, I'm not going to claim to understand the whims and goals of each and every underworld entity. One last little tidbit before we move on to our final demon of the day, Varine was supposedly involved in a pretty large-scale possession way back in the 17th century. Yep, it possessed a whole swath of nuns, which had plenty of implications for the church and those who followed it. Fun, right? And finally, at number one, we've got Louvart. Supposedly the only fallen angel amidst the demonic hierarchy, Louvart is often referred to as the Prince of Angels. High praise for someone so low. This demon is many things, but one that appears quite often is the idea that he presides over possessions. Louvart was even blamed for the possession of Sister Madeline during the demonic attacks in 17th century France. A round of applause for Louvart, everyone. Jolly good show. In fifth place, we have cherubs. Cherubim, commonly known as cherubs, are usually depicted as chubby, beautiful, and bare little beings with wings in art, as represented by Renaissance sculptors. These depictions of cherubim are often connected with divinity. These animal-human hybrids have been associated with cupids, the diaper-clad chubby babies who are sometimes shown with a trumpet and arrow to symbolize romantic love. Some may attribute this modern-day image to Cupid-like Greek and Roman deities. On the other hand, the biblical image is frequently attributed to cultural exchanges with ancient Babylonia, Egypt, and Syria, which explains their mixed appearance. According to the Bible, cherubs are responsible for guarding the Garden of Eden, the great biblical terrestrial paradise against humankind when Adam and Eve, being not the first humans, were driven out of the heavenly garden. And as cute as that sounds, time to talk about the real thing. The prophet Ezekiel's vision of cherubim are, is depicted in the book of Ezekiel, quoted as follows. Follows. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf, had the face of a human being, and on the right side, each had the face of a lion, and on the left, the face of an ox, each also had the face of an eagle. They each had two wings spreading out upward, and each had two other wings covering its body. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire or like torches. Fire moved back and forth among the creatures. It was bright and lightning flashed out of it. Okay, so let's break that vision down. If I'm counting correctly, that's a grand total of four faces, four wings, two regular legs, but with calf hooves instead of feet. I'm trying to picture it. It sounds something like a really bad mutation cooked up in a lab. Genuinely the kind of stuff you don't release to the public. Let me know if there's men in black by me. Okay. In fourth place, we have fur fur. Kind of reminding me of the term not deer. It may sound funny, but sadly, this isn't a laughing matter. Fur fur, or fur furs, in Latin means brand. Okay, I promise it's scary and not just cereal. Bear with me, would ya? It seems much more likely that the name is a corruption of Fursifer, the Latin word for scoundrel that also rhymes with Lucifer, which works with him being a count of hell and all. If you're not familiar with the ranking of hell demons, the Lesser Key of Solomon, also known as Lamegiton Clavicula Solomonis, or simply Lamegiton, is an anonymously awful authored grimoire on demonology. It was compiled in the mid-17th century, mostly from materials that were approximately several centuries older. It is divided into five books, Ars Thergia Goetia, Ars Paulina, Ars Almadel, and Ars Notoria. Focusing mostly on the Ars Goetia, it classifies the 72 demons into classes. Kings, dukes, princes, marquises, counts, knights, and lastly, Presidents. Furfur is the ruler of 26 legions of demons, which is no small feat. He is a liar unless compelled to enter a magic triangle where he gives true answers to every question, speaking with a rough voice. Furfur causes love between a man and a woman, creates storms, tempests, thunder, lightning, and teaches on secret and divine things. Visually speaking, he appears as a deer with wings, shiny, crazy eyes, and sharp teeth. I swear I didn't know this before making the not deer joke a minute ago, but hey, maybe hanging around with a professional mind reader friend is starting to rub off on me. Coming in at number three, we've got Legion. One person can be many things, but in this case, one demon is actually many demons. And these demons were so nasty, so evil, that Jesus himself had to exorcise them. Holy smokes, right? Legion is quite popular in the pop culture pantheon, and many famous exorcisms and related events seem to use him as the prime example. With so many demons dwelling within one main demonic form, they can take over the souls of people relatively easily and with varied results. However, all of the demons that make up Legion act as a sort of hive mind. They all have the same knowledge, thoughts, and reactions to things, and if one demon from the collective experiences something, they're all aware of it. With all of that knowledge and the ability to spread out all over the place, Legion can be a terrifying adversary. 
And even though Jesus does manage to send Legion back to hell in the Bible, there isn't much guaranteeing that many parts of Legion can't come back. Most folks only experience Legion as individual parts too. This is when the demon is at its weakest, as each individual piece of the whole only holds so much power. Were Legion to assemble all of the many together, we could be in trouble. Imagine all the limbs. Coming in at number 2 we've got Betis. Ah, corruption. Such a classic human form of folly. We work so hard to avoid it and even do our best to prop up those who remain pure of heart and purpose, but corruption spreads pretty much no matter what. We can thank Vetus for that. Second in command to Lucifer himself, this is the demon who wants to tempt holy people away from their chosen path. Even the most pious has a chance of being drawn in by this demon. He works very hard at figuring out people's deepest desires and then encouraging them to revert everything they believe in to achieve said goals. Oftentimes these desires are less than socially acceptable and at worst they can be quite taboo. Does Vetus care that he's ruining lives? Probably not. He takes on different forms to be extra convincing and makes sure to really sweeten the deal whenever he can. However, there is a way you can tell if Vetus is trying to tempt you. He only speaks in rhyme. Interesting, right? Hold on, there's a form of communication that almost exclusively communicates in rhyme and tells people to act in all sorts of wild and depraved ways. Music. Pop music specifically, but hey. Do you think that Vetus is communicating with modern folks through the tunes we so often hear on the radio, telling us to consume, to cavort, to consummate? That's insidious. And finally at number one, we've got Beelzebub. Speaking of music, how many songs explicitly reference Beelzebub? I can think of two right now, Bohemian Rhapsody and Beelzeboss. I'm sure there are plenty more, but you can drop those in the comments. As you do that, I'll continue on my way talking about this demon. Beelzebub, the lord of the flies, the devil, but also maybe not the devil. There's so much to say about this particular demon and so little time in which to do it. I'll see what I can do with what we've got today. So the lord of the flies may be associated with literature read in schools these days, but back before we had a tale of British boys losing their minds on an island, that association with insects was filthy. Ruling over flies meant you had domain over demonic excrement and rot. Not a good thing, right? Throughout history, people have blamed Beelzebub for all sorts of things. He was closely associated with the Salem witch trials and cited often when folks were put to death. Plus, years after that was called off, he was again referenced in many exorcisms, both infamous and unknown. All of this pales in comparison to his actual standing in hell though, where he is known as the Prince of Demons, and rules over the other basement dwellers with an iron fist. His ultimate goal is to destroy the world and it seems as though he's been planning this for ages. Tricking people into worshipping false idols, commanding other infernal beings, and sowing seeds of discontent, nobody's doing it quite like Beelzebub. I'd recommend learning a song, wicked enough to defeat the devil, otherwise you're probably ending up going down to hell with him. Number 5. The Behemoth You wanted 5 more creatures and I wanted an excuse to keep reading this thing. This book is terrifying. Speaking of, did you know that there's a herbivore creature plated in spikes and armor with a tail the size of an oak tree, head like a lion swallowing up rivers just roaming around back then? Yeah, apparently. The Behemoth. This Goliath of a beast was one of the first talked about. Not the first beast, that's a completely different thing. Also terrifying. The Behemoth. God's secret weapon, and apparently the first thing he created. Hadn't made us in his image yet, so uh, this hippo tank Elder Scrolls boss was what God went with. One of the most popular and revered creatures in the Bible, quote, Behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee. He eateth grass like an ox, he moveth his tail like a cedar, his bones are as strong as pieces of brass, his bones are like bars of iron. Yeah, this is definitely a dinosaur, right? Right? Scholars seem to think that the behemoth is an aggressive exaggeration of a large hippopotamus or rhinoceros. Opening up its mouth and swallowing a river could literally mean it's just an animal thirsty. In 2003, French scientists working in Pakistan claimed to have discovered an extinct species of rhinoceros called a Baluk Ethereum, which was much larger, much scarier, and matched the physical description given in the book of Job. Yeah, that's terrifying stuff. Number 4. Cherubim These cute flying baby angels we see on soap ads and bottles are a lot scarier and much more sinister than the blonde cupids we're used to seeing. The cherubs, or cherubim, are God's throne bearers and appear over 90 times in the Bible. The Hebrew text says cherubim is a celestial winged being who represents God's spirit on earth and symbolizes the worship of God. In Ezekiel, cherubim are described as angelic creatures with two sets of wings and four faces, lion, ox, human, 
an eagle. Okay, this is getting scarier and scarier. The four faces of the cherubim apparently represent the four domains of God's rule. The lion represents wild animals, man represents humanity, ox represents domestic animals, and the eagle represents birds. Aren't those all wild animals? I don't know. The cherubim appear in several texts of the Bible, including Genesis, Ezekiel, Kings, and Revelation. Yeah, so lots of people were seeing these things, and they all kind of sound somewhat the same. They all oddly say four faces, like every which way they turned they could see a face. Some say, quote, they move quickly, using a wheel within a wheel, and their wings cover their body. Question. What's with all the wheels? People just like looking up into the sky all day must have had like severe floaters in their eyes because a wheel and a cute baby angel thing look completely different, no? A conjoined wingspan of the four cherubim are described as forming a divine chariot, the so-called mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Two cherubim make the Ark and form a space through which Yahweh would appear in Ezekiel's visions. The status of the cherubim are a sort of vehicle for Yahweh in the book of Samuel. So in a sense, they're kind of God's messengers, you know, bringing things up and down from him and to him, including him. Gotcha. A vehicle. Yeah, a vehicle. These images are terrifying. Yeah, and that's a mothership right there. That's a mothership. Okay. In third place, we have Seraphim. According to the Christian angel hierarchy, Seraphim hold the highest rank. The two main historical influences on Seraphim's name come from the Hebrew term Seraph, spelled S-A-R-A-P-H, meaning venomous desert snake, and Seraph, spelled S-E-R-A-P-H, meaning to burn. The Bible describes Seraphim as having six wings, four of which are used to cover their heads and feet in front of God as a symbol of humility, and the remaining two used to fly. Unlike the cherubs, seraphim are not guard angels. Seraphim are described by the prophet Isaiah as angelic beings that continually worship God by surrounding God's throne and singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory in unison when God approaches. Cripes, I think that's the most I've chanted since I stopped frequenting the Catholic Church when I was in like grade nine. Also, by constant, I mean around the clock kind of constant. They never stop. While they are the epitome of helpfulness and forgiveness, their appearance installs fear in those that lay eyes on them. Several historians suggest that the description of the seraphim's wings and flames may have been based on the connection with Egyptian imagery and description of the cobra. I guess I spoke too soon when I was praying I would never have to talk about snakes ever again. And in case I wasn't clear enough, not only do these snakes have wings, they possess fire capabilities. That's way too many levels of terrifying for me. Nope, not gonna happen. In second place, we have Ophanim. They're described in the book of Ezekiel as their entire bodies, including their backs, hands, and wings being full of eyes all around, as were their four wheels. Now, the only way I can picture this not being absolutely terrifying is if they were covered entirely in cute, sticky, googly eyes. Wait, I just pictured it. Scratch that, that's also nightmare fuel. Ophanim, or the wheels, are one of the strangest, most bizarre beings referenced in Ezekiel's vision. They're portrayed as beings made of interlocking gold wheels, with every wheel adorned with numerous sets of eyes on the exterior. These wheels, however, do not change directions as the creatures move by floating in the skies. The second book of Enoch refers to Ophanim as the many-eyed one, and they're sometimes also described as spheres or whirlwinds. Specifically speaking, in Christian angelology, they are one of the classes of angels and are also called thrones. There's an interesting theory that the Ophanim are the wheels attached to God's chariot. These wheels have been associated with Daniel 7-9, where they are mentioned as Galgal, traditionally the wheels of Galgalin, in fiery flame and burning fire of the four eye-covered wheels which are each composed of two nested wheels that move next to the winged cherubim beneath the throne of God. Four wheels move with the cherubs because the spirit of the cherubs is in them. Some folks, like former NASA scientist Jose F. Blumrich, believe that Ophanim might have been what we consider a UFO sighting today. As someone who has talked a decent amount about UFO and alien sightings lately, I'm tempted to believe it at this point, and it would probably help validate a lot of modern historical sightings. And in our first place position, we have the Archangels. They are the second lowest ranking angels, so I can kind of understand why they might be a little more likely to do evil things. The English word archangel is derived from Greek archangelos, the Greek prefix arch meaning chief. In Christianity, Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel are the most commonly recognized messenger boys and are celebrated in the Roman Catholic Church with a feast on September 29th for Michael, March 24th for Gabriel, and October 24th for Raphael, which uh, I guess that's kind of sweet. But if you should know by now, we don't exactly do sweet here. Michael was involved in battles and fought close with his good friend Lucifer, who, you know, I'll call Lucifer right now to make things
things a little fun. When Lucifer's pride, otherwise known as one of those pesky seven deadly sins, got the best of him, he decided to stage a full-on rebellion against God. He and a third of the angel population launched a war in heaven over the coveted throne. If I had a banner right now, I'd be cheering him on. Michael, being the good guy he is, wasn't having any of this. And he and his angels rose up against the threat in an angel-on-angel -angel war that ended with Michael laying down the law and casting the rebels out of heaven. Lucifer was hurled from heaven down to earth and was now labeled Satan, which means adversary. Granted, this wasn't the last time Lucifer and Michael fought, with Michael later winning the fight for Moses' soul when Lucifer tried to claim it first. Oh well, can't win them all. Next up, we have Gabriel. He had the fun task of announcing the birth of John the Baptist to Zachariah. But when Zachariah's initial reaction was one of protest, Gabriel's anger escalated rather quickly, stating, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and bring to you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, you will become mute unable to speak until the day these things occur. Look, maybe give someone a minute to process what they're seeing if they're not used to seeing angels before you curse them for, you know, reacting normally. Might be a safer bet. I'm no expert. Even then, my chatterbox self would take that over Raphael's mean streak. The Book of Enoch tells the story of Raphael's battle with the demon Azazel, and Azazel's fate at the hands of the archangel is so much worse than death. Under the orders of God, Raphael bound the demon's hands and feet, found a hole full of rocks, dumped him in it, and buried him alive in the desert where Azazel just sorta of had to wait before being burned at the stake. I can see where people got the inspiration for how to handle witches. Now that I've discussed the main three, there's a fun little honorable mention I didn't want to leave out. Uriel, a lesser known archangel, was against the idea of fallen angels taking human wives to breed with, so he spoke up and requested divine intervention in the matter. He wasn't taking it easy on anyone either. Even the humans were considered guilty of defiling mankind with these unions, and ignorance was not an acceptable excuse. The existence of these crossbreed abominations and the desire to rid the world of them led to a great flood to cleanse the earth. So, uh, thanks for that. Anyone out there have a spare arc? I hope you'll understand now just how terrifying archangels are.